Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? It's an infamous question that resulted in a brutal murder. King Henry II probably never spoke these exact words, as they only start to be attributed to him from as late as the 18th century, but that hasn't stopped them being repeated again and again. And it's easy to see why, as this curt one-liner encompasses a story that made an indelible mark on European history for better or worse. It is a tale of ambition, betrayal, redemption, miracles, and of course, a crime that would echo through the centuries. Upon returning to England, Thomas's first priority was damage control. Whilst he had been away building up connections and relationships on the continent, his reputation in his homeland had suffered. He needed to rebuild those friendships if he was to survive, and top of his list was the young king. His opposition to the coronation had not made him popular with the 15-year-old co-monarch and Thomas needed to make it clear that he had no ill will toward the boy. Shortly after arriving in Canterbury, Thomas was on the move again. This time the target was Winchester, where the young king was spending Christmas. With his entourage assembled and on the road, Thomas sent an emissary named Richard of Dover ahead of the main caravan to formally request permission to approach. Unusually, though perhaps understandably, the young king refused the archbishop's request, and a crestfallen Thomas was forced to turn his caravan around and return to Canterbury. According to several of his biographers, Thomas spent the next few weeks suffering under a sense of impending doom. His homecoming had been less than triumphant, and he must have felt like a stranger in his own country, surrounded by enemies, scorned by those in charge. For the first time in a great many years, Thomas must have felt helpless. And on Christmas Day, he preached a sermon in Canterbury Cathedral, in which he predicted his own demise was soon at hand. But it didn't take divine insight to see that Thomas Becket's days in the sun were coming to a close. Meanwhile, Thomas's enemies were abroad. Without his knowledge, three bishops stole away from England. They were Roger de pont levesque Archbishop of York, Gilbert Foliot, Bishop of London, and Jocelyn de Bowen, Bishop of Salisbury. They were the three who had overseen the young king's coronation, and whom Thomas had dramatically excommunicated in his letters before leaving France. They made their way to the royal hunting lodge at Beurre-le-Roi, near Falaise. Their intention was to tell the king of the archbishop's actions, but by the time they reached him he had already heard and was absolutely furious. Now we come to what is probably the most famous scene of the narrative. In his rage, Henry bellows, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? And four loyal knights with close ties to the king take this as their cue to go and commit a heinous crime. It's a striking image and a good story, but as far as we can tell, it's not really accurate. So let's try that scene again. Garnier de Pont Saint Maxence, writing at the time, has Henry's rage seem much more personal, reporting him as saying, A man who has eaten my bread, who came to my court poor, and I have raised him high. Now he draws up his heel to kick me in the teeth. He has shamed my kin, shamed my realm. The grief goes to my heart, and no one has avenged me. And then, of course, 
It is this cry for vengeance which spurs our four loyal knights to action. Or is it? The infamous knights were Hugh de Morville, William Fitzurs, Richard Brito and William de Tracy, all high-ranking members of the Anglo-Norman aristocracy, with landed estates that neighboured one another in Somerset and Devon, and close enough to the crown to be spending Christmas at the King's Hunting Lodge. But despite their rank, they weren't part of Henry's inner circle. Three of the four, de Morville, de Tracy and Fitzurse, were from families that had prospered under the rule of King Stephen. And despite having managed to cling on to their properties after Henry came to power, they were never among his favourites. Perhaps then, what spurred them on was not a sense of duty to avenge the king, but a sense of opportunity to gain his favour and move their families back into a position of power. In Edward Grimm's account of the events, Henry is not railing against Thomas Becket, but berating his so-called allies, exclaiming, What miserable drones and traitors have I nourished and promoted in my household, who would let their lord be treated with such shameful contempt by a low-born clerk? There's a chance this wasn't even directed at the Four Knights, but at some of Henry's closer companions, companions who the Four thought they could usurp by going beyond the call of duty. And so the Four Knights hatched their plot. Now, some accounts of the tale like to claim the Knights were drunk, or at least had been drinking enough to make a rash decision. But again, this isn't likely the case. For one thing, they had to make arrangements to cross the English Channel, which I imagine is enough to sober anyone up. They arrived in England on the 28th of December and stayed in Saltwood Castle in Kent. They were the guests of the de Brock family, who had been given custody of the Archbishop's estates during his exile and harboured a deep resentment at his return. The de Brocks had already been harassing Thomas, hunting on his lands, catching and stealing his hounds, and laying ambushes around Canterbury in an attempt to provoke him to violence. No doubt they were a huge contribution to the sense of impending peril that had haunted Thomas since his return home. The following morning, on the 29th of December, the four knights and their retinues made for Canterbury to enact their plan. But what exactly was their plan? Well, as they publicly proclaimed to the townsfolk of Canterbury that they were seeking Thomas Becket and to either aid them or stay out of their way, it's very unlikely they had planned for the day to end the way it would. Their aim, most likely, was to arrest the Archbishop and drag him back to the king, to force him to stand before a court like the one he had fled from in Northampton six years prior. Certainly, if they had intended anything more violent, they wouldn't have declared themselves so publicly. And it is in fact because they did announce themselves that we have such detailed accounts of what happened as the town was filled with eyewitnesses, watching in trepidation as the armed and armoured knights made their way through the streets towards the Archbishop's palace. The four knights and their retinues arrived outside the palace, which lay in the northwest part of the cathedral precinct, in the late afternoon. Despite their fearsome show to the townsfolk earlier, when it came to confront Thomas, they removed their armour and weapons, stashing them behind a nearby tree. Although they had seemed prepared for violence, they clearly did not expect it, or at least hoped their target would surrender willingly. 
Thomas had just finished his dinner and moved to an anteroom to attend to some business or other when the knights entered. The knights were silent at first, but after Thomas greeted them, they began to curse and insult him. Thomas was incensed and, perhaps to the knights' surprise, began to argue back. They had come into his home and he wasn't going to let them speak to him that way. Accusations were thrown. Fitzurs claimed that Becket wanted to take the young king's crown from him. For this reason, and for flouting the king's wishes, he declared Thomas would have to come with them to face royal judgment. Now, the suggestion of a cleric, an archbishop no less, being subject to royal judgment will have only enraged Thomas more. And not only did he refuse to leave, but he began provoking the knights, demanding, Have you come to kill me then? As the four stormed out of the palace, he followed them to the door, shouting at them all the way. At that point, with tempers boiling, the knights put their armour back on and drew their swords. They positioned their men around the courtyard to prevent Thomas's escape. Seeing this, the archbishop's men barred the doors to the palace. Those inside urged Thomas to escape, bundling him through the cloister and into the cathedral itself. His men then went to bar the cathedral doors, but Thomas stopped them. Perhaps he thought the sanctuary of the church would see him saved. Perhaps he felt there was no point resisting any further. Serenely, he made his way up the stairs to the choir where the monks were singing vespers. In the nave, townspeople mingled witnesses to what was about to unfold. Outside, the knights saw another means of entry. One of the de Brock family, a man named Robert, had accompanied the four and showed them how to get in through the upper gallery. As the knights and their men, dressed in the garb of war, burst into the cathedral, they shouted, Where is Thomas Beckett? Traitor to the king and kingdom! The terrifying and frankly sacrilegious sight caused many to flee, leaving only a handful behind. Thomas, unarmed, defied the knights nevertheless. Walking back down the steps, he stood between two altars, one dedicated to the Virgin Mary and the other to Saint Benedict. Again, the knights tried to arrest Thomas, grabbing him by the arms, but he pushed them back, shouting, You and your accomplices are acting like fools! More insults followed, and the situation was truly out of control. De Morville moved back to stand guard against the slowly approaching onlookers to ensure they weren't interrupted. What happened next is unclear. It was dusk and the witnesses couldn't get too close. A flurry of activity. At some point, Edward Grimm, one of Thomas's clerks and later biographers, leapt to his defence. Witnesses also seemed to agree that Thomas himself dropped to his knees in prayer, commending his soul to God, perhaps anticipating what was coming next. The first blow was struck by either Fitzurs or de Tracy. It sliced across Edward Grimm's arm, nearly severing it, before cutting deep into the top of Thomas's head. Whether it had been aimed at Edward or Thomas or both, we can't know. But what followed were several more sword strikes to Thomas's head. As the flurry of blows ended, Thomas slumped forward, face down on the flagstones. Richard Brito delivered a brutal downward strike with such force that it broke his sword tip against the flagstones. It severed the crown of Thomas's skull, sending bone brain and blood gushing onto the cathedral floor. The final indignity 
came from one of the men who had accompanied the murderers. Hugh of Horsey was not a knight, but a clerk. He placed his foot on Thomas's neck and, taking a sword, pushed its tip into the open skull and then flicked pieces of viscera out onto the floor. Looking up, he said, Let's get out of here. This fellow won't get up again. The repercussions of the murder were felt almost immediately. The culprits fled the scene, and as the gravity of their action began to sink in, they ransacked the Archbishop's palace, likely trying to find something incriminating they could use as justification. When nothing turned up, they fled northwards to hide, holding themselves up in Knaresborough Castle. At the scene of the crime, no one knew what to do. After a short while, members of the congregation started coming forward to dip their fingers or scraps of cloth into Thomas's blood. That night, the body was carried into the choir and placed on the high altar. The soiled clothes were removed to be given to the poor, and much to the monk's surprise, they found Thomas had been wearing a hair shirt a coarse garment used by penitents to irritate the skin and mortify the flesh. Some took this as evidence of Thomas's regret over the worldliness of his past. The next morning, Thomas was given a rushed burial that lacked the usual funeral mass. A rumour had circulated that the armed men might return to take the body away, perhaps to be burned or otherwise destroyed, and the monks wanted to avoid further conflict. A marble coffin in the cathedral's crypt was chosen, and Thomas was laid to rest. After the burial, the cathedral was closed to the public, as the spilling of blood had desecrated its sanctity, and time was required to cleanse the building of this stain. Within three days, news of the murder reached Henry. Arnulf, Bishop of Lyseur, described his reaction. The king burst into loud lamentations and exchanged his royal robes for sackcloth and ashes. At times he fell into a stupor after which he would again utter groans and cries louder and more bitter than before. Was it all for show? Arguably, the bitterness of their falling out is evidence of how precious Thomas's friendship had been to Henry. Perhaps he had hoped all along for reconciliation. For the next 40 days he ate nothing but bread and water, a public display of penance, but Henry never formally admitted culpability, and he was blamed for the crime. Oh yes. Thomas's other royal friend, Louis VII, wrote to the Pope denouncing Henry and demanding violent reprisals. William, Archbishop of Saint, also wrote to the Pope, urging for the excommunication of Henry. Henry himself did not admit fault, and his own letter to the Pope expresses grief and regret, but ultimately blames Thomas's provocations for his untimely end. A commission of papal legates investigated the crime, and based on their findings, the Pope placed Henry's continental territories, but not England, under interdict, and excommunicated the four murderers. They later visited Rome seeking penance, and were sentenced to an expedition to the Holy Land. All four are presumed to have died en route or in Jerusalem. Back in England, Henry never took official legal action against the four, but seems to have arranged it so that their male heirs didn't inherit any property, effectively ending their dynasties as landed knights. On the 21st of May 1172, Henry met with papal legates at Avranches in Normandy, where he swore upon the Gospels that he had not sought Thomas Becket's death. He then agreed to a number of conditions set down by the Pope. These conditions were a posthumous victory for Thomas, 
as they removed a great many of the customs Henry had introduced, which infringed upon the rights of the church. Henry confirmed them again in a public ceremony in Cannes on the 30th of May, and by September that year, Pope Alexander had formally approved the agreement, and Henry was officially exonerated. But Thomas's legacy doesn't end with his death. Mere days after the murder, miracles were being reported at Canterbury. The scraps of blood people had taken and the soiled clothes given to the poor became holy relics. The overwhelming number of pilgrims wishing to visit the martyr's tomb forced the cathedral to reopen early. Within a year, of Henry's exoneration, Thomas Becket would be canonised as Saint Thomas of Canterbury. <laughs>